All right. <clears throat> we are going to begin, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming here. Um, just a couple of uh, procedural points. Gordon Brown is on his way here in a helicopter and will at some point burst onto the stage in a dramatic moment. Um, we'll just... We'll just keep going and uh, maybe take a moment to bring him up to speed. Um, he knows the issues uh, we're discussing very well, so I don't think much will be needed. Um, there will be, uh, we're going to do this in an informal uh, conversation style, no, no speeches. Um, and so I thought I'd just plunge right into it. Look, let me just quickly set the scene so that others don't have to. Um, and tell you what, what we're talking about. We're talking about something uh, on this panel like sleeping sickness, which is a tropical disease caused by the Setsi fly. And probably 300,000 to 500,000 people are affected by it, contracted. Untreated, it will kill you. The only treatment for it is 70 years old. It is literally a combination of arsenic and antifreeze, or at least those are two of its principal ingredients. Um, about 5% of the people who take it, uh, who take the cure, uh, die off it. So the question is, what can be done about it? A drug company that used to produce um, a, a drug that would have been a substitute has stopped doing it and is out of the production business of doing it because it is simply not make profit. It doesn't make any sense from a market point of view. How do you deal with the problem, this problem, multiplied when you have other diseases uh, that you have to uh, 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 confront? What I thought I'd do is I'd ask Chris Murray to very quickly uh, expand on my layman's understanding of this and, and tell us what is, the, what is the nature of the impact of these kinds of diseases? How should we think about them? Um, what, 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 you know, what's the universe we're talking about here? Uh, thank you, Fareed. If you look at the sort of biggest picture around the world, uh, there's about 58 million people who die every year from all causes of death, uh, both in the rich world and the poor world. And more than a quarter of all those deaths are from just seven conditions. Uh, and I think at least most of those would be in our uh, forgotten, at least in the West, uh, category. So at the top of that list would be nearly 4 million dying from pneumonia, and that's from a host of different pathogens, and I'm sure we'll hear in the discussion that there are vaccination strategies that can work and both treatment strategies for pneumonia. Uh, low birth weight and prematurity for newborns and leading to high rates of neonatal mortality is uh, probably next on the list with uh, 2.5 million deaths. HIV with 3 million deaths is in there as well, of course. Diarrheal disease with nearly 2 million deaths a year. And I, I'm sure we'll talk about the exciting potential with uh, rotavirus vaccine, uh, as well as oral rehydration therapy as the sort of mainstay for the last uh, two decades or so. Tuberculosis is also in that list with about uh, 1.6 million deaths a year. Malaria, about another 1.2 million. And then a cluster of childhood preventable diseases or vaccine preventable, that's diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, and measles that make up uh, 1.2 million deaths. All that seven together, that's 15 million deaths a year. And I think it's important for us to recognize that just under half of that's in Africa. So of that 15 million deaths, uh, all of which of course are premature because they're affecting young children or young adults, and in any reasonable sense of uh, aspirations for people's health, those in the West account for a very small fraction uh, of death. There's technologies for them all, and there's also new technologies coming in the pipeline that'll make it more practical to overcome implementation obstacles, but I'm sure we'll come to that. Uh, Bill Gates, let me ask you the question that I'm sure a number of people in the business world think of when they hear about this, the, these stories and they hear about this drug company, uh, the, the, in this particular case it was Aventis, which said, look, you know, we are focused on our core markets and our core product, products, which are, this guy was very uh, frank about it, which are diseases that affect people in rich countries, particularly that affect, uh, uh, particularly those that are ameliorative rather than curative. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the perfect 
a problem for a pharmaceutical company is something like arthritis. You, you, know, you need the medicine constantly, it ameliorates, it doesn't cure. Now, put yourself, uh, which is not difficult, in the, in the position of the CEO of one of those pharmaceutical companies. If somebody were to come to you and say, I want you to make a, a, a cheap uh, software, and I want it to be the kind of thing which is used in the third world, and once used, will never, there will never be a demand for it again. Um, how would that work? How, how should we think about the market incentives versus the cure? Well, if we ever have a panel on neglected diseases and fill the room, maybe we'll have to say we're not neglected anymore. So I'm, I'm glad to see we're definitely neglected here today. Uh, the, uh, there's a market failure. Uh, you know, markets work super well for a lot of things, but in health, um, it, there's real problems in that the people who have these diseases don't have the money to justify the investment. It can work okay when the rich world has the same disease condition that you get a, a sort of trickle-down phenomenon either through differential pricing or eventual uh, generic drugs that uh, there's the R&D benefits of uh, in rich world medicine do help the world as a whole. But when you come to these infectious diseases, virtually everything that Chris mentioned, the amount of death you'd see from it in the rich world is very, very small. And so there isn't that market uh, to do the invention. It's not enough to simply say, hey, why don't these companies just take and start losing money and do these things? They can do it to some degree. They can uh, do, you know, some donation, they can put good scientists in, but for the kind of grand risk taking that's involved in inventing new drugs, funding the trials that are necessary, uh, they need uh, philanthropic or governmental type money to come in and help them out with that. And we should say that these last five years have been very good in terms of starting to have a lot of those activities taking place. You know, and overall, you know, there might, there's certainly less than 30 disease conditions that, uh, you know, go into these big numbers. Diarrhea probably breaks down to four or five, the pneumonia down to four or so. And then, you know, you'd get uh, still in significant numbers, think things like trypanosomiasis, that's the sleeping sickness, and, and some others. And there's, we're starting to see activity on those, still not at the level uh, that we need to. So we need more of these public-private partnerships, there is some variation in the pharma companies and biotech in terms of how willing they are to reach out and see these opportunities. Um, one of the great things we've seen is that the funding of uh, this vaccine initiative that uh, Norway's been a fantastic giver to, Italy's participating in a, a new round in a, a great way, which is the IFFIM, that's really said to the world that we're willing to take what we have today and make sure that they get purchased and delivered. As long as that message wasn't there, people would say, why should we invent something new? Because we're not even taking the interventions we have today, and we're not at all serious about delivering them. And so it was very fair for government funders or even drug company people to say, look, even if I came up with this, I don't think it would have all that much impact. And so we need to get rid of that almost uh, correct but cynical view and say, look, anything new that comes up, we find a way uh, to create the delivery system and, and, and get it out there. So a huge market failure that requires visibility, awareness, uh, government activity that we are seeing an uptick in. You, you, you described, uh, Bill, your own foundation, others, um, governments, IFFM, uh, all these, uh, these initiatives. What's the gap now? Do you think there is still a significant gap in funding? No, the gap is unbelievable. The, the, the difference between how we treat the value of a life in the world at large versus how we treat the value of life in a rich country is over 100 times difference. Uh, you know, and that's, in a sense, a conscious decision that we make uh, given the way that we've allocated resources and that we run things. And you know, there are people like Paul Farmer who sort of devote their life to saying this is outrageous, this can't exist, I'm gonna just you know, throw myself into trying to reduce that. But it's, it's very systematic. And so you get big numbers, uh, you know, numbers in the 
50 billion a year type range when you ask somebody like Sachs to you know, add it all up and say what would it take to make a change. As a percentage of the world economy, that's not that much. Now, there's, it's not just brute force money. There's a lot of incentive systems of getting doctors to be in these countries and uh, measuring the result, results, getting feedback for those results. So it's, it's not just financial, but uh, that is one of the things that holds back this incredible inequity. And, and it, it's, uh, even if we make amazing progress over these next 10 years, and I'm incredibly optimistic about the new level of science that's been unleashed here and the partnerships that have been put together. You know, we can go through all the diseases Chris mentioned. There's some activity uh, that would give us hope that 10 years from now, many of these that we'd have uh, vaccines, uh, at least in the case of AIDS, we won't have a vaccine in that time frame, but ideally we'd have a microbicide that a woman could use in a covert way and change, uh, eliminate her risk of, of uh, of getting the disease. Uh, so even with 10 years of progress, we'd still see a, a dramatic disparity. Right. Right. Uh, President Obasanjo, what does this look like from your perspective? Um, I imagine some of these diseases are not really that neglected in the sense that you live with them. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, when you talk of neglected diseases or forgotten diseases. Uh, as I said, uh, when we were in the room, I said, neglected by whom? Forgotten by whom? Those who are living with those diseases do not neglect them. They may not have the resources to uh, take adequate care of them, but they are victimized by these diseases. And the government and the family and the community of people who uh, uh, will suffer from these diseases, do not forget them. <coughs> they um, know that these diseases uh, do exist and they are there. Um, and uh, as Bill rightly said, uh, it is the cost of really taking on treatment <laughs> and giving adequate attention to these diseases. Um, then what do we do? We have to find at our own level, in our own uh, uh, locations, and within the limit of our resources, what can we do with these diseases? Prevention, of course, is better than cure, if we can prevent. So uh, where we can prevent, we do prevent. And it's also cheaper. Prevention is not only better than cure, it's also cheaper than cure. And I just take malaria. Well, for as long as we have not provided, uh, uh, be able to produce a vaccine to deal with malaria, or to get rid of mosquitoes, we have to prevent. And what are the cheap ways of preventing? Mm -hmm. uh, impregnated uh, nets for children under the age of five, um, for uh, pregnant women, and, and these are, are cheap enough. And, um, uh, and they are also available, and you don't need any complication to use them and to make them available. And you can actually uh, uh, monitor the use of them and the results you get from them. Um, because if uh, you, 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 you uh, <coughs> give out impregnated uh, badness in a community, you can check the number, whether the in infant mortality comes down or and by what uh, uh, quantity comes down. Now, the other thing, and I, I mentioned this uh, when we were um, talking earlier on, that for us, we have to also show to the world 
and to people like Bill who are concerned about this and other um, uh, donors that we are making effort. When we in Nigeria had debt uh, relief, we decided that the money we should have been spending in servicing debt will be set aside and will be budgeted for specific areas of relieving, uh, uh, dealing with issues of diseases, of education, and we put that budget in such a way that it can be monitored. Anybody can come and say, hey, what have you done? How much of the money that you, you should have paid to service your debt have you put for education? Um, which area of education have you put it? Is it primary education? Is it um, secondary education? Is it tertiary education? How much have you put in the, into um, uh, health uh, care? Is it HIV and AIDS? Is it malaria? Uh, and these, are, I believe, are things that we should do because I believe that if the donors those who are assisting us see that we mean business, they will be encouraged to, in fact, take and go uh, a, 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 a longer, um, uh, uh, take a, a extra mileage with us. You, you mentioned malaria a lot, so let me ask uh, uh, Bill Gates one, one question relating to malaria. Uh, DDT, this is a little less... Uh, uh, less simple, perhaps, than mosquito nets. Why is it that having used DDT to wipe out malaria in the developed world, we have developed such enormous qualms about using it in the developing world? Should we not use DDT as, certainly as part of the package? It strikes me that there's no silver bullet for malaria, but this is an urgently needed uh, addition to the arsenal. Yeah, you're right. In malaria, there's a lot of different things that it, all of which are, are complementary. The bed nets, uh, indoor spraying. Indoor spraying with something like DDT doesn't involve the same impact on the ecosystem that the widespread agricultural spraying caused. And so it, there actually is a case for using it there. We're funding the creation of new insecticides because you never want to depend on one. Uh, you get resistance and, and we saw some of that with DDT. Uh, there's also this idea of, uh, as a child's going up, giving them some medicine so that they, they don't get severe bouts in the malaria. The ultimate thing uh, is the vaccine, and, and we've seen some progress on that with the candidate, but we need to keep funding all the different approaches uh, while we, we try and get that, uh, that final thing. So yes, DDT could be used as part of a program, and some nations are, are doing indoor spraying that way. Um, Prime Minister Stoltenberg, let me ask you, uh, Norway is the sort of poster child for, uh, for foreign aid. You, you, I think you hit the, uh, the ODA target, was it 0.8% of GDP? Um, do you, are you sure your money is being well spent? How do, you, how do you track whether having given all this money, you're getting something for it other than a feeling of, uh, you know, of, of general goodwill? At least we are sure that uh, it's better to give money to developing aid than to not do it. Uh, and if the alternative is to, is to keep the money, I think the developing world will be the loser. But of course, we, we, we could be able to spend the money in an even better way. And therefore, we are very uh, eager to develop new ways of measurement, new ways of monitoring, new ways of doing developing aid. And that's also one of the reasons why we have engaged so much in supporting the uh, Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization because we believe the whole idea of Gavi is a new way of doing uh, development cooperation. Uh, and we have engaged in that because uh, uh, vaccines is a very efficient way of saving lives, and uh, is a very efficient way of fighting poverty. And uh, we are focused uh, particularly on the development goal number, uh, Millennium Development Goal number four, which is uh, uh, which is to reduce child mortality by two-thirds. And the only way of doing that is to be able to immunize more children. It's about 10 million children who 
who, who die every year, uh, about one-fourth of them uh, could be saved by vaccines or vaccines which are available today or vaccines which are available in the near future if we invest in research. So, um, so I am in favor of uh, the Gavi idea, the immunization, the idea of immunizing every child for, in a way, three reasons. One, as a father, because I've seen the, the importance of protecting my own child by uh, vaccines. Second, as an economist, because it's a very cost-efficient way of fighting poverty. I, you hardly uh, find any other tool or mean where you get more return per dollar invested. And thirdly, as a politician, because it's much more easy to explain to my parliament, to the voters, that this is the right thing to do, because it's so easy to, to see that immunization is saving lives. It's very concrete, it's possible to measure, and we know that vaccines are, are working. So, um, so in Norway, there, are, there is some debate on, about developing aid, but no one is against immunization. So uh, it's a very strong case in our country. Chris. <clears throat> Chris, when you look at this, uh, you see these mountains of money that are being, uh, being generated in, in some substantial measure because of Bill Gates' generosity. Do you worry that this, you know, there's an enormous of focus on the inputs. What are the outputs? What are the things that should be measured? Um, are vaccines that easy to, to, to measure? Are other things easy? How would you determine whether this was a success other than the... Uh, the, the criteria which seems often to be used, which is the money spent. What is the, other, what is the output criteria that you should use? I think the, the simple answer to that is uh, impact on people's lives and saving lives and making people uh, live healthier when they are alive. And there's all sorts of ways to go about doing that. I think uh, we should be careful to not measure for the sake of measurement. And I think in this area, the reason measuring what we achieve collectively uh, is so important comes to the sort of third part of the challenge. We have the need for money, because poor countries just can't afford to deliver all the things that they need to. We have the need for existing technologies and new ones, and, and uh, people like Bill Gates are driving this uh, new science in, in that direction. But we also need to find ways to deliver effective technologies, because some of these technologies have been around for 25, 30 years. And in some cases, the money's been around, and still not a lot of progress has been made. And what's exciting about Gavi, what's exciting about uh, this shift towards focusing on outcomes, is that if we actually measure what's achieved, we can create, uh, we can foster creative strategies for delivery, we can create incentives for countries to experiment on how to get these technologies to people who need them without having a single size fits all delivery model. That puts a big uh, onus on getting the measurements right. And pretty much everybody recognizes the importance of that, but I think we are enormously underfunding that dimension around global health. If, if you wanted a rule of thumb, I think four or five percent of what goes in uh, as flows to help global health should be going for monitoring what we achieve in terms of delivering the technologies to the people who need them and their impact on health. And my guess is we're spending less than one percent on that. Well, there are two um, <clears throat> There are two innovative um, government-based solutions for the market failures Bill Gates was talking about. One is the uh, International Finance Facility, and the other is the AMC, the Advanced Market Commitment. I'll ask Gordon Brown, if and when he appears, to, to speak about the first. But Mr. Tremont, did you want to tell us what exactly uh, the AMC is, and how does it fill the gap that, that uh, Bill was talking about, where drug companies do not have an incentive to create uh, new products for poor countries in which it would be a one-shot deal and they've cured their, uh, they've, they've made their own product obsolete. Uh, the, our political approach as G8, uh, disease are more efficient than the market. Uh, disease like malaria, pneumococcus, uh, HV, kills more than seven million people each year. Uh, the Latin, uh, the Latin name for medicine, uh, of medicine is Ars Longa, long heart, long. 
in rich countries, life is longer and longer, not in poor countries. Here we conserve the historical binomial pauper et infirmus, poverty and infirmity. Somebody said some years ago, if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. Uh, we have problems, we have needs. The problem is pharma companies do not invest because they fear that even if they discover a vaccine, poor countries may not have the money to buy it. The need, we need a stronger market because investment in these areas are insufficient. G8 and other donors can, must make a difference. This is the idea behind the AMC, Advanced Market Commitment. The Italian project presented G7 last December in London. The G8 countries can commit to buy vaccines if and when they are discovered, so they can remove the uncertainty before any money is spent. We organize a fund, we are waiting for the result. If the result is positive, we pay. What are the basics of the HMC? It is cost effective if compared to other forms of aid. It is focused on results. Money is paid only if vaccines are produced. It is complementary to other instruments like the Global Fund. It's market-based, based on competition compatible with the international law on intellectual property and allow the private sector to decide the avenue, the research avenue to follow. It leaves uh, recipient countries in the driving seat. See, they decide what they need. What is the <coughs> next step? Uh, we agreed in London last December to finalize a pilot project in the spring meetings uh, of the G8 uh, in, uh, in Washington in 2000, in this year. Our work is now to identify the disease that have to address it in the pilot project. And this is dramatic because uh, you must compare timing and uh, money. To prepare details of the financing and legal framework to supply administration and support functions in a way to minimize the costs. At the end, I want to thank the UK presidency of the G8, we are waiting Gordon, and specifically Gordon for having done so much to focus on these issues. Let me conclude. The, 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 the name of this session is not gone, but almost forgotten. My true dream is for another session, a day, one day, not forgotten, almost gone. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over um, to the audience, uh, but I thought I'd ask one last question to uh, President Obasanjo, which is one of the uh, many efforts that have been taking place over the last few years have been debt relief, most particularly this year. <coughs> What's happening to that money, if, if, I, if it doesn't sound too rude to ask? Um, can, one of the th concerns people have had is that the money that, that um, the debt relief money is now used in a transparent and accountable way. What can you tell us about how Nigeria is handling the money? I thought I touched upon that earlier on, but let me re-emphasize it. <clears throat> we assess about $1 billion is what we save from the servicing of Paris Club uh, debt relief that we have got. And what we did was to take the items in the MDG, the items that 
will make us to be able to achieve the uh, goals by uh, 2015. And we parcel that money out to uh, those uh, sectors, uh, maternal care, child, uh, 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 our infant, infant mortality uh, care, uh, education, particularly uh, girl child education. Now we, we move and we put in our budget a definite amount and it's not part of the normal budget. We budgeted for this amount separately so that whether you are a Nigerian or uh, a friend of Nigeria or a, uh, a, or a country that forgave the debt and you want to see what we are doing, we can show you on the ground, we can show you in the budget, and then we set up a committee, including uh, civil society people who are actually monitoring how we are performing, how we are spending this money. So the $1 billion that we have uh, gained from the debt relief that we should have used in servicing debt, uh, this is the way we have uh, uh, put it to uh, deal with issues that are relevant to MDG. Um, ladies and gentlemen, questions from the audience? Sir? <coughs> Good morning. I'm Gary Cohen, president of BD Medical, which is Becton Dickinson. I'm also national chair of the U.S. Fund for UNICEF's HIV AIDS Campaign for Children. And uh, Becton Dickinson is perhaps one of the uh, few companies that's investing specifically in low-cost technology development for developing countries. My question involves uh, the broader picture beyond the drugs. There's, it's appropriate that there's such focus on the drugs, and there, it's absolutely necessary, but I just want to point out it's not sufficient because uh, in the absence of effective diagnosis and monitoring, massive drug resistance is already emerging in certain areas, malaria. TB and HIV AIDS being three areas. And uh, what can be done to further stimulate the recognition of the role of, of diagnosis? Uh, there are people being treated for malaria who are just coming in with a <coughs> fever who don't have malaria, for, exist for example. And the technology is being used today in Africa to diagnose TB are at least 50 years old. They invite mic microscopes and slides. There are much better technologies available. So what, what can be brought? to round out the picture for appropriate recognition of the role of diagnostics, and also the recognition that the health systems that exist, the health facilities that exist in sub-Saharan Africa themselves are insufficient to take care of this issue, particularly when you get beyond just providing a vaccine. There's insufficient capacity, both human capacity and physical capacity in most places. I also want to point out that there's been great success in a number of areas, success that was really stimulated by and accomplished by Gates Foundation funding and Gavi around childhood diseases such as measles and tetanus and emerging progress on polio. There are many hospitals in Africa that are closing their measles wards. It's an incredible positive sign. Measles deaths have been reduced by almost 60% over the last several years. Tetanus deaths are down by about 25%. So there is a model that's worked that we could build upon. So those are my questions. Bill, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, <coughs> yeah, it's very important to recognize that different kinds of interventions have complexity of, of delivery. Even vaccination, which might be the simplest thing of all, where you just need to get children to come in for three visits when they're young, the coverage rates for that aren't uh, fully understood and they're nowhere near where they should be. So a lot of money needs to go into that. As you move into more complex interventions like tuberculosis, where today the best treatment regime requires compliance over a six month period dots, which has been a great thing. but. You know, imagine how much easier that would be if it was a one-month uh, duration, which new drugs uh, that we haven't had for over 30 years could actually give us that. The toughest thing of all, there's a tiny irony, which is 
the most visible world health crisis uh, has been people suffering from AIDS. And there, because we are treating people in rich world, we have some of the disease in rich world, the idea that you could see people dying where we had uh, the, both the human, the personnel and the drugs, the finances to give it, that people decided we need to take this on, and which is fantastic. Uh, Global Fund, PEPFAR, wonderful efforts. But that's actually taking on one of the most difficult things to do because it's a lifetime disease <coughs> where if you don't comply even for a period of weeks, you can, uh, your regime can start to fail on you. And there's some expertise required, and as, as the questioner asked, there's some diagnostic uh, viral uh, load count that's required. You know, when you go to India, there are uh, less than a dozen uh, viral load uh, count machines available in the country. So it's basically just not done. We need to get the price, the complexity, the servicing of those things down. And there's uh, part partners like Benton Dixon that are, are stepping up. Uh, we need dipstick tests where you can just see does somebody have TB or not. It's always amazing to me how little the numbers are known as you really dig into them, the amount of estimation uh, that's gone on in these things. There is hope for a new generation of diagnostics, uh, blood tests, uh, stool tests, sputum tests, uh, uh, even genetic tests that are, are going to give us a much more rational view of these things. and and could in many cases cost only a few dollars uh, to get those things, but it's absolutely part of the picture. Then getting trained personnel in is another part of the picture, which at least for uh, AIDS treatment, that you, you know, we don't know how to get rid of that. We have great ideas to do some minimization. Uh, models have been tested in Haiti and uh, Botswana, but uh, still doctors could be the limiting factor there. Ma'am. Victoria Hale, the Institute for One World Health. I'd first like to thank everyone in the room for caring about neglected diseases. I wish this room were overflowing, but thank you to all of those who, who are here. Um, my question is about diarrhea. Um, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, or HIV, TB, and malaria uh, made it on the list and get a lot of attention. Respiratory disease and and diarrhea do not. We know they're high on the list. Chris presented this in the, in the introduction. Um, it's going to take uh, a discussion of the problem, um, picturing the problem, imagining the problem, discussing the problem. Uh, why, what will it take to get people to discuss diarrhea and to get diarrhea on the cover of magazines, for instance, um, so that um, we can prevent or treat uh, the children, two, two million children uh, die every year from, from diarrhea. Why is it in the state that it's in and why don't we talk about it? Chris, do you want to take that on? You know, I uh, teach a uh, introductory course for 18 year olds at uh, Harvard about global health. And I'd say in the first month, all they want to hear about is HIV. And that's uh, partly, as Bill just described, because the injustice of HIV is so visible. People have the same disease, they're treated, and they have quite uh, impressive survival at home. And that's not happening in poor countries. And so it's just obvious that it's about money. Uh, but slowly, you can get them over the course of two, three months to broaden that notion of what are the challenges afflicting poor people and where do we have opportunities uh, on the science development side or even using things that we currently have. Diarrhea is in some ways uh, a partial success story in the sense of the research on oral rehydration therapy, uh, a very low cost appropriate technology. It's just never had the population level impact that we hoped it would. So I, uh, my, guess for the world of getting it on uh, the front of covers of magazines is the same thing for how you slowly get people to broaden from that 
central concern around HIV and keep broadening out. Uh, it, it's time and repeated exposure. It's events like this. Uh, I don't actually think fecal oral transmission uh, will ever be sexy, so to speak. Uh, so I think it's just repeated messages and, and hopefully uh, raising the, the sort of collective consciousness about these sets of problems. Prime Minister, you wanted to add something? Yes, I would just like to add that uh, one of the things I think is very important with the Global Alliance for uh, Vaccines and Immunization is, of course, that the focus is on these old diseases because it is important that we do something with HIV AIDS and we have to engage very much and that mobilize money and so on. But, but, but that's not an excuse to, to forget all the traditional diseases which actually are killing more people than HIV. And that's, and that's one of the things which, which makes Gavi very important and, 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 and what the Gates Foundation has done and what the UK and other governments has, has done is to, is to emphasize, also focus on these traditional old diseases which has been then in a way forgotten. And it's always meaningless when children are dying, but it's particularly meaningless when they die out of diseases they easily could have been protected against. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, measles, it's easy to avoid children dying from measles because we have the vaccines. And it's in the near future, it should also be easy to, to, to avoid that children die for di from diarrhea because we are investing in, in, in the research of, of, of vaccines against diarrhea. And, and of course, GAV is partly buying vaccines, partly investing in the infrastructure, but even as important is investing in, in, in research for new vaccines, like uh, vaccines against diarrhea. And of course, it's nice if it's on the cover of the magazines, but it's even more important that we do something, and we are in the process of doing something by, through the Gates Foundation, through the GAVI, and through all, all the others who are engaging in the fight against diarrhea. Yeah, in terms of diarrhea, the, the next big event is the availability of a rotavirus vaccine. Something like a quarter to a third of that diarrheal burden is rotavirus. Another one of these numbers we don't know as well as we should. But uh, there are two vaccines, one from Merck and one from GlaxoSmithKline, with the right work with those companies and what Gavi calls their advanced development program. We hope to get those vaccines out in developing countries where the burden the disease, all this disease burden is. Typically, it's about a 20-year time frame between when a vaccine is used in rich world, uh, and these will, uh, there actually was a rotavirus vaccine that was used for a while in the rich world, and then there was a rare side effect, so it was taken off the market, the, the Wyeth Rotashield. Now, these two uh, have gone through big, big tests to try and make sure they don't, they don't have that problem. So we have that. The next causative agent is uh, probably cholera or Shigella, and we need to get a uh, vaccine against that. If we got those two in ETEC, uh, we might have a, a high percentage of it. There is work on what's called an anti-suppository, which would also uh, make a big difference as a treatment for diarrhea. I have to say I was stunned when I first learned about disease burden. You know, I, uh, many of the names I expected, but acute respiratory infection, which is the pneumonia category, and diarrheal diseases, they stunned me, absolutely. And if you take relative neglect, actually those two in terms of how little money is spent and how many children die from it, those are number one and, and number two. Uh, things are changing because of Gavi and some new initiatives, but I'd still say we're behind relatively on those two. And is it, is it again simply because they affect people in poor countries? Basically, yes. Yeah. Uh, they, it, you know, why, why don't we have a, uh, a, some vaccines against n pneumonia? There's a, you know, there's certainly a causative agent that's probably over half of that that we should be able to get a vaccine for, and we're just getting going on on getting that. And ironically, it's probably a vaccine that can be sold in the rich world as well. The whole thing about how you test vaccines, particularly if they're a certain type like live attenuated, it's gotten very tough now. Many of the vaccines we have today, it's hard to imagine that in today's system you could actually uh, invent those and get those trialed. And so there's a, a conservatism that's appropriate that is, has made things a lot tougher. Minister Tremonti, you wanted to add something? 
best, uh, second best, uh, it's uh, tragic to select uh, human problems, uh, scientific problems, uh, financial problems. This is the political responsibility to, to select, uh, to identify a disease and to invest. It's a matter of timing, in my opinion. Uh, it's necessary, it's time now to, to move from the discussion to an action. Sir, at the back there, yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Tony Fauci from the National Institutes of Health in, in uh, the United States. Uh, I just want to take up on <clears throat> the comment that was made both by Chris and by Bill, and that is what the incentives are and why we don't have vaccines for diseases that are perceived to be not diseases of the developed world. I think if we look at the AIDS model, a lot of uh, misconceptions we had originally on AIDS, if you look at the amount of investment and the partnerships with pharmaceutical companies that went into the development of antiretroviral agents, it's really a very important story. We now have more antiviral drugs for HIV than the sum total of all the antiviral drugs that we have against every other viral disease combined. And the reason is, was the perception and the driving of the push of research and the pull of the marketplace. So it can be done. If we apply the lessons for HIV AIDS to the diseases that we're talking about now, true, we do have a lot of countermeasures with vaccines and drugs that just are not being distributed. But if you put that aside and talk about the diseases for which we don't have a vaccine or we don't have a drug, the first myth is that there isn't a direct relationship between the resources you put in and the results. AIDS has completely shown that to be the case. You put enough money in, you'll get the resource, you, you'll, you'll get the countermeasures. The next thing is the assumption that because we're dealing with a developing world, we're not going to be able to get drugs to them. I think that assumption is again being proven wrong with HIV, which when we went from literally handfuls of people on drugs in the developing world, we're not anywhere near where we want to be, but we now have you know, 400,000, 500,000 people on HIV drugs. The point I'm trying to make is that I think what we're doing today and what Chris and Bill and others have been doing for a long time is continuing to put attention on the fact that we need to have government industry partnerships to address these, and if the incentives aren't there, I think the governments of the developed world have to give the incentives to the drug companies to make those vaccines and to make those uh, 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 countermeasures such as antimicrobials, antiparasitics, or antivirals. And I was wondering if Chris or Bill has any comment about that. Thank you. Sure. Well, I, I think it's a glass half full. Uh, you're absolutely right that if you'd said to the drug companies, how easy is it to do an antiretroviral, you know, how many of those have we had? In the past, they would have said this is pretty bleak, but because the, in, the market was there, they've had quite good success, which contrasts in, in general where drug productivity has actually been fairly low. That's a, a bright spot. I do think, though, if you look at the relative amount of money that's gone into antiretrovirals versus a vaccine, uh, you can see there a, a market failure that you might even say is a market failure just looking at the rich world alone because it's very hard to make an economic model for a, a one-time treatment versus chronic treatment. There's, there's this perverse incentive that things that require chronic treatment have unbelievable business models compared to cures uh, for diseases. So I, I think you know, even the US government has to think about why that misincentive, that systematic uh, underinvestment that would take place there, how do we moderate that? And, and, you know, your organization is now part of this enterprise alliance we're trying to get going to, to deal with that. Um, you know, we need, we need more on the vaccine side to match the success in the antiretrovirals. Tony, if, if as you claim, which I think is an a, a exciting claim that if you put the money, we'll get the products eventually, uh, then it comes back to almost the same question about how do you get these diseases that don't really have a, a much of an effect in the high income world where most of the research dollars are, how do we get your institution, for example, like NIH, to put more of its budget into these very problems? And 
uh, I guess that's uh, a marketing task to Congress and, and to other groups, and you probably have more insight. Sure. Because we've been thinking always about health for the nation that you happen to be funding for. I think there's an increase and a swell of interest now in looking at health in a global way for institutions like our own. Uh, five years ago, we were putting less than $100 million into international health. We now have half a billion dollars in it. And I think all institutions need to be looking more in the arena of global health instead of the provincial issue of what's good for the country involved. And until we do that, Chris, we're not going to make any progress, I don't think. Are, are we doing that, Tony? Let me ask you. As, uh, is the United States doing that, thinking more in terms of global health rather than American health? Yes, very much so. Not enough. I mean, we are clearly not where we need to be. But if you look at the last five to seven years, there's been an enormous increase for it than, uh, compared to what it was in the early, late 90s compared to 2006. And is there a similar shift in uh, at research institutes in Europe? You know, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I think the money for research and biomedical research ha has been very, very tight because of certain economic considerations. So I don't think that's happening. I don't want to speak for every country, but in general, that's not been the case. I, I think the irony is that some of that increase in terms of the political willingness to do it has more to do with the statement that, look, rich people could get sick uh, <laughs> than it has to do with the human welfare argument that should uh, weigh the day. And I, you know, I guess we should be willing to use whatever tactic leads to the right resource allocation. But I do find it odd that it's, it's basically, hey, we might get sick too, and now we got to take this seriously. That's really uh, motivated most of the political, some of the political action. Sir. So. I'm Peter Eigen. I'm the founder of Transparency International. Uh, next week, we are going to issue our annual Global Corruption Report, which will this year be under the theme uh, Corruption in the Health Sector. So um, I would simply make sure that the issue, which sometimes is almost forgotten, uh, that one has, protect, um, has to protect the resources which are now made available to the health sector worldwide, are protected against corruption. I know one of you um, who is sitting up there who was one of the co-founders of Transparency International, President Obasanjo, has this very much in his mind because he's struggling against corruption in his wonderful country every day and sometimes even every night. But I wonder what uh, the others feel about the need to give a very explicit attention to the issue of how to protect um, your work against corruption, to have an effective health delivery system worldwide. Let's start with President Obasanjo, though. Um, why don't you start I, us off? Well, um, Peter, I thank you for uh, bringing this out. I, of course, I, the, the corruption in the health sector uh, is in many, many uh, uh, ways. What of corruption in giving contract for hospitals and clinics to be built? and inferior materials are used, and then the hospital or the clinic collapses on uh, poor victims in there. What of the use of uh, fake drugs that are delivered as um, uh, authentic? Um, what of the use of uh, drugs that uh, have expired, that are relabeled and uh, sent to our own countries, and um, uh, people unwittingly uh, use them. Um, we have a very active uh, drug enforcement uh, uh, team and agency, and. Um, what it has discovered and what it has done in the area of corruption in the health care delivery is uh, uh, almost monumental. And I hope what you will bring out in your report will be along this line. And I, and I believe that just a little bit of money will also help in 
in dealing with this issue of corruption in health uh, sector. Prime Minister Stoltenberg, would you like to? Yes. First of all, I think we have to admit that, it, of course, it is corruption also in the health sector, and, uh, and we have to fight it, and it's very serious. Uh, second, I think it's important to underline a very basic understanding that is that even if there is uh, corruption, that's not an argument against uh, public money to public health, but it is an argument, uh, argument in favor of fighting corruption because it's sometimes misused in a way that the existence of corruption is an argument against spending money on these uh, purposes like, like uh, new vaccines and so on. And thirdly, I think that the existence of corruption is a very strong argument for do more of, a, of what Chris was talking about in the beginning, more monitoring. And, uh, and, uh, and not only monitoring the books, but also go out in the fields, out in the villages and count how many children are immunized, how many children get the different kind of health services. And, uh, and one of the things I think we should work more within, within Gavi is how to develop monitoring, how to be more concrete and specific, uh, because that's a way of also fighting corruption. Chris, when you look around at this, um, what do you do if there is syst systemic corruption? What do you do if, um, you know, if, they, if there is this problem? Just to, to uh, follow up the Prime Minister's comments on that, I think one of the ingredients is measurement of what's achieved with resources, because it becomes much harder to hide corruption. But it's not just the measurement, it's getting that out to the public, getting that out to both technocrats and government, but also civil society and a broad audience in every country. So I think this part of the story about creating accountability for health systems and part of the story about decreasing corruption is the interplay between measurement, the media, and having a sophisticated enough civil society that they can use information to then turn around and put pressure uh, where they, they detect things are not being achieved, whether through corruption or just through inefficiency or, or, or bad programs. Um, let me interrupt us for a moment to welcome Gordon Brown. Um, we've talked, uh, Gordon, about the market failure um, that makes it uh, that, that makes it so that drug companies do not have a strong incentive to produce some of the drugs for uh, diseases affecting uh, people in poor countries. You have uh, been the leader in, in one effort to uh, remedy or to fill a gap in this market failure, uh, the IFF. Do you want to just? Take a minute to explain what it is and why you think it's going to work, um, and, and then we can maybe get into a, a short discussion of it. Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, can I apologize uh, for being late, but you may ask um, anyway, uh, in a discussion about uh, medicine, drugs, the future of healthcare, uh, what uh, finance ministers like uh, Julio and I have to contribute uh, uh, to this. Uh, we have uh, Bill Gates, whose progressive philanthropy is known throughout the world. We have uh, President Obasanjo, the great uh, reformer, in Africa, we have Jen Stoltenberg, who has been uh, led uh, the conscience of the, the world, and uh, Norway has done so much. The reason I think finance ministers are important to this, and what happens in ministries of finance is important, is I think it is now within our power to link uh, the innovations that are taking place in medicine to financial mechanisms that can make these medicines and drugs and treatments available far more quickly, far more accessibly, at prices that people can afford. And if the issue of last year, uh, here at Davos and at the G8 at Glen Eagles, uh, was making commitments for the future, the issue this year and beyond is delivery uh, and then results. Uh, and I believe uh, looking at the future of healthcare and the application of new advances, uh, what we can do with innovative financial mechanisms is incredibly important. In other words, what is lacking at the moment is political will, and I hope that we can provide some of that over the next uh, few years. Our, our first uh, proposal uh, has been for an international uh, uh, finance uh, uh, mechanism that would front load uh, investment in uh, new drugs and new treatments, uh, but perhaps more than, more than front loading, give sustainable finance uh, to develop healthcare systems, particularly in Africa and developing countries, over a number of years. 
In other words, most aid has been for a year or two. When I was in Tanzania a few months ago, the Prime Minister Mankapa said he just could not make healthcare free for certain drugs because he had no guarantee of finance beyond a year or two years or three years. And therefore, the first thing that uh, we've been working on, and it is to Bill Gates' uh, great uh, credit that he has backed this uh, project, uh, both with his own resources and uh, with his uh, incredible creative uh, mind in these uh, issues. The first project is the International uh, Finance uh, Facility for Vaccination, where we are going to be able to front load $4 billion uh, of uh, finance so that vaccinations can be done now uh, and we can have guaranteed finance for a period of 10 years that I think Bill's own researchers have calculated would save uh, something in the order of 5 million lives. The second uh, mechanism is what uh, Julio has been working on, the advanced uh, market uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, and I think there's a great deal of work got to be done on this, but I'm hoping at the G8 meeting in Moscow in only a few days' time, we'll be able to agree to back uh, medical projects whereby innovative financing, we can encourage the research that is necessary and eventually link that to bulk purchase of drugs at affordable prices. Now, there are areas where this cannot be done because the amounts of money necessary to finance the initial research has got to be done by either public funds or philanthropic funds. Uh, but the incentive uh, that is available to bring a drug uh, forward is one that we wish to um, uh, innovatively uh, try out in relation to one or two uh, uh, potential drugs for the future. But if I can just say the third issue and then stop uh, for, for more questions. I, I think we've learned in the last uh, year when we've been looking uh, at what uh, can be done that the issue is not so much uh, finance, it is the empowerment uh, of the countries uh, and the peoples and the communities that we are, we are talking about. And I believe the next stage is to build capacity in healthcare systems. And I believe that we should be asking uh, developing countries to produce long-term health plans, not short-term health plans, but long-term health plans about how they can build the capacity of their healthcare systems. And again, I believe we can find innovative financial mechanisms by which we can come behind these plans. Uh, Winston Churchill once uh, said of uh, the lack of political will in the 1930s that people were resolved to be irresolute, adamant for drift, solid for fluidity, and all-powerful for impotence. The danger, the danger is uh, that promises turn out to be less than pledges, less than commitments, that we do not deliver on them. And that's why I'm sure that this year, Having had a huge focus last year on making commitments, the focus must now be on these practical systems of delivery uh, where a, a large number of people have got a great deal to offer, but where finance ministries, in my view, have got to link the innovations that are being made in healthcare uh, to innovative mechanisms of financing them. And that's what I hope to work on with you over the next year. Uh, Uh, let me ask you, Gordon, the, uh, the focus you've, you've set for yourself on delivery, um, building of healthcare infrastructure, you know, cr creating that kind of broad-based system, that sounds awfully like development in general and has, had, has met in the past with very mixed results despite large amounts of money thrown at the problem. How do you see, you know, there's, a, there's an old uh, saying in the Jewish tradition, why will this night be different from any other <laughs> night? Why do you think that this time on, on that core issue, not vaccines, I understand, it's a one-shot deal, the limited amount of corruption that, that, that can take place, but healthcare delivery is inextricably tied with the general level of development and, and you know, lack of corruptibility in the society. Well, I think the, the earlier question was, was exactly, but just as I came in, was about uh, transparency, <coughs> about uh, the avoidance of uh, cor corruption. Uh, and, and, and clearly, we must back the reformers, people who are making the reforms, like President uh, Obasanjo, uh, and we must uh, do that in a systematic way by insisting on transparency in monetary policy, fiscal policy, corporate rules, uh, right across the public finance uh, systems. But I think that the answer lies in country-owned and community-owned uh, plans for, for healthcare and education. The World Bank, as you know, is experimenting with fast-track plans for education. I believe there is a parallel that could be uh, thought of in relation to health. Uh, but my emphasis at the moment is on how we can develop longer-term plans. 
Uh, so instead of finance for a year or two and then drying up, uh, people can build community support, local support, neighbourhood support uh, for healthcare plans that can be implemented over a period of years that will involve training of nurses and training of doctors uh, and not simply coming in with one initiative that when it dries up leaves people asking, uh, well, where has everybody now gone? Does anyone uh, w w want to get, talk about this for a second? Um. No, I, I just would like to uh, underline very much the po importance of that Gordon Brown mentioned of, of long-term finance because it, it, you, need, you, you need to know that you have money also next year and the year after to invest in, in health, health infrastructure. And that's the beauty of, of the international finance facility which, uh, uh, some, with which Gordon Brown and the British government has pushed so much forward and which is now uh, come, becoming a, a success. Uh, and, um, and I think the importance of the international finance facility is at least two things. One is that you get legally binding commitments. Because so far you have, been, you have seen a lot of countries pledging a lot of money but without following up. Through the international finance facility they are legally binding themselves to, uh, uh, to donate or to give money. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, is uh, of course that you have the front load. You get the money now. Because it's, 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 uh, it's very important to immunize children today. It's too late to immunize them in 10 years because they are dead in, in the meantime. And, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the third thing is that by or to the international finance facility, you get the long-term financing. So, so Gordon Brown and the British government has done an excellent job. Great. And, and I, 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 I think, I, it, yeah, please. I, I just want to uh, thank uh, Gordon. I, I will just uh, put three points on this, uh, uh, we, 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 what we should be talking about and uh, where we are, where we should be going this year. I think the point has been made at the community level, at the neighborhood level, at the national level, there must be ownership. And then there must be the delivery. And um, just beyond promises and pledges, there must be delivery, and then there must be monitoring. Monitoring internally and monitoring from outside. And if these three are put together, we will get there. Um, let me get back to the questions. Uh, there, right there, yeah. Uh, the gentleman at the back first and then, then from, yeah. Uh, my name is Garth Jaffet from Soul City Institute of Development Communication. I'm raising a question which I think is the big black hole in global health, which is that there is a huge emphasis on technological solutions, which is absolutely correct. Vaccines, new drugs, etc. But there seems to be a complete black hole when it comes to thinking about how you develop the market. How do you make sure that people do actually access vaccines, stay on TB treatment? Diarrhea is a very good example. And oral rehydration solution is what can save children's lives long before a vaccine will. And yet in development finance, there is very little money going into communication. And yet it, in, in big business, uh, governments rise and fall on communication. But in this field, develop, in, in the field of development and health, there seems to be this complete lack of thinking and resources around how we actually develop a market, how we keep people on treatment, how we um, make sure that people actually have the knowledge that actually will bring an end to a lot of these issues. So I'd just like the response from the panel. Thank you. Bill, you want to take that on? Well, I, it's all, we're all in a feedback loop in terms of what works and Believe me, there's a ton that goes into communication. <coughs> Building these grassroots organizations, often non-governmental organizations like the uh, BRAC in Bangladesh that are overwhelmingly women's organizations that are reaching out to women in the villages, that's how you get vaccination rates up, that's how you get oral rehydration therapy rates up. Uh, we've done a lot of communications things. One interesting thing about communication is that there was once a belief that if once we had AIDS awareness in a country, that that would change behavior. And so 
You know, most of the billboards in South Africa and many other countries were bought to educate people. And we did surveys. We got the awareness weight rates way, way up without any noticeable change in behavior. And so communication is very complex. We spend a ton of time with the, the press in the country thinking about these grassroots organizations that are going to uh, do the delivery. In the case of vaccination, it's, it's really just having uh, the discipline to do these systems right. There are countries that have 95% coverage for their vaccination uh, rates. And it's not that they're doing communication a different way. They're just managing and measuring their system in a, in a better way. So th there's a limit to what pure communications can do. And I think the image of what needs to be done to get compliance, it's not your classic sort of uh, communications challenge. President Obasanjo, how would you answer this question? You have a, a, a rotavirus vaccine that comes out, or you have a good treatment that is available. What is the way to ensure, in a country like Nigeria, that it is, it is something that is then adhered to week after week, month after month? Well, Bill was right um, in saying that um, at one time, we all believe that if we raise awareness and uh, conscious, consciousness, um, the habit will be, uh, the, uh, there will be change in habit. Um, habit change does not uh, correspond with the amount of awareness. Um, then what do we do? I think the, we, we just have to persist, I, I, I believe, because in our part, for a while, people just don't believe that there is anything like HIV AIDS. Um, they just don't, they don't believe it. They say, well, the same people that have been dying are dying, and uh, so what is new in that? People die. Uh, but when you show them that, yes, we have always had death from, time, from the time God created human beings on, uh, in this world, but this time we are having a different type of death. And you, you, it, it goes on and you show it not only in the urban but in the rural. And we found, we found, I must say I was uh, amazed. I, I thought, and that is my own ignorance, I thought HIV AIDS was an urban or semi-urban uh, prevalent uh, thing. But it was found to be even more prevalent in the rural area. Um, because when at first we thought or we believed that it's only uh, transfer by uh, needle and uh, and that sort of thing. Then we found that, um, no, it's as prevalent in the rural area and as it is in urban area. And when you make that clear to them, when you make it known to them, um, then it starts uh, getting in and people feeling, oh yes, there is something in this. We found, one thing we found, that the children, uh, it, it, it's difficult, but we found that educating the children about these things has, inf has impact on the behavior of their parents. We, we, we found that. And maybe in, in, in terms of this, uh, we, we should try every means that we regard as an innovation that will work. Um, we have used the religious, Islamic and Christian. And the Islamic at first were not willing to come along. But we convinced the leader of the Islamic uh, group in our country, the uh, Sultan of Sokoto, and he then led. And the ulamas who thought it's uh, untouchable, then they took it on. 
and it started having effect. Uh, as I said, we, we had to try all things, and um, together we will, we will get an impressive uh, outcome. I think we have time for really uh, one last question, and I thought I would ask it to you, Bill Gates, and, and, and ask you uh, to, to close where we started, which is how do we make this subject uh, seem less urgent. Um, you know, the, you, the point you make uh, and you've made uh, often in the past is that if these diseases were affecting people in rich countries, they simply would be, there, there would be solutions to them found. Um, do you find that that mentality of viewing a, a, a life as, as uh, less valuable uh, when it is in a poor country is changing how do you think you, you change it? I mean, this, this would seem to me the core frustration you must feel when dealing with this issue. Well, certainly to get the broad government support that we all know is necessary, you can't just have enlightened politicians like the ones we have here. You've gotta, they've got to be backed up by the, uh, the voters in a very broad way. And so I think some of the most creative stuff is, is the work that uh, Bono's taken a lead on, uh, the Live Aid event, the so-called One campaign. And then this week he announced a new thing that I, I'm very enthused about where there's a set of products like a red Amex card and some other red products that you can associate yourself with that, that uh, actually generates funds uh, that go to global funds. So the, Whenever we sit and talk with people and really tell the story, the interest level, I think, is very high. And yet, you know, you can say in the next presidential debate in the U.S., will it be a significant discussion about are you willing to uh, make the trade-offs to have the U.S. Uh, fulfill its commitments and even uh, be more generous? Would that be raised as something of significance to be debated? That's a uh, a metric that uh, Bono and I talk about that you know may, may be achievable. One, if it keeps growing the way it has been, uh, could get five million people behind it, and, and ideally that would be activated in a, a very strong way. So we're making progress, um, but uh, we need a lot more because it's got to be it's got to be a grassroots thing. It's got to be uh, widely felt because we're talking about enough money here. Uh, that it, it really does represent a trade-off. It's not a rounding error in terms of the, the overall budget priorities that governments have to, to set. Well, with that, we're going to have to leave it at that for this, uh, this session. Thank you all very much.